Uh, so it's 2 p.m., so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome, everybody, to MesosCon. Um, it's a packed room, which is awesome. So it's great to see so many people are really uh, thoughtful about production worthiness and uh, keeping their sites up and running. Uh, fortunately, that's what I do every day, all day, and I've done that for over three years at Twitter. Um, so in this talk, uh, actually, this is probably going to be a little bit different from most, if not all, other talks here. Uh, most of the other talks are going to be a little bit happier, maybe more positive. Uh, this is the one. This is the one that's not exactly going to be marketing friendly. Um, so this is actually what it takes to run cloud infrastructure. Um, we're going to discuss all the failures that have happened. We're going to talk about a lot of the annoying things that have cropped up over the years. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of the ways we've fixed that and we've Im improved things. Um, so actually, for me, this is the talk I've wanted to give for all of these years, and I'm really excited about this, uh, because we've learned and grown from so many of these experiences. Um, so Aurora and Mesos, uh, it's not just something that a few teams have built. It's something that the entire community has collaborated on. Everybody that's asked a question in IRC, that's filed a bug report, that's submitted a small one-line patch to documentation, everybody has worked to improve these systems and make them what they are right now. So um, I think it's really important that we don't forget this message and that we remember that in this community it's okay for us to share production issues, production outages, and actually make sure that we're making the most resilient distributed systems possible. So that's what I believe and I think most of the community believes that as well, which is why I like it so much. Uh, so now we're going to run through what we're going to talk about over here. Uh, so the first one, um, we're going to start with some background. So this is the why of everything that we're doing here. Um, typically we sort of just like run straight through it, so I think it's important to kind of set the context a little bit. Um, after that, we'll talk about some of the annoyances. So these aren't things that are going to cause incidents, but they're going to make it a little bit more difficult for your users to actually take advantage of your infrastructure. And it's also going to make it more difficult for your operators or your SREs, your DevOps, to actually make sure that the site stays up and running. Uh, and then lastly, uh, again, this is the fun part. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the worst case scenarios that come up. Uh, so we're going to kind of escalate and get a little bit more and more terrifying. Um, so that's, again, the fun part, which is pretty cool. Uh, and, then la and we'll also share what to do if it happens to you. Um, so sometimes it feels kind of like a battle in the cloud when you're uh, managing all these clusters. Um, but really what this emphasizes is that uh, everything that we're going to be talking about here today, uh, these are all based on real world experience. So you know, we started with you know, just a few machines, and now we're running at tens of thousands. Uh, and we've migrated hundreds of services from their own bare metal infrastructure on top of sort of cloud native applications. Um, you know, some migrations I was very heavily involved with, and some I was a little bit more hands off, and some you know, I didn't even know what was going on. Um, and uh, lastly, there's also another talk that I gave a few months ago at an Aurora meetup, uh, which is discussing our build and deployment pipeline. So um, if you're sort of considering how can we actually sort of follow in some of these footsteps and set up things in a little bit more of um, sort of a similar way that we do, then uh, I highly recommend to take a look at that. Uh, this is linked from the slides, so it'll be there. Uh, so moving into this, um, Again, we really want to make sure that we're understanding why we're doing this, uh, especially as we get into some of the outages, uh, because when I describe them, you're probably going to say, well, this is a terrible idea. Let's never do this. Um, but I think what you'll see is that actually some of the trade-offs are going to be worth it. And there are ways that you can mitigate failure and actually move away from that, which is going to be really helpful. So um, this link isn't working, which is terrible. Uh, if you don't follow Cloud Opinion, I highly recommend it. Uh, I chuckle every now and then. Um, essentially, this was just uh, some fake commentary about, oh, we should use containers. Well, why do we use containers? Oh, because containers are really hot. OK, but why are they hot? Oh, they're just hot. Just use them. It's fine, containers. Um, so I think everybody in this room, thanks for chuckling, uh, everybody kind of gets that. So there are actually some reasons to use this. Uh, not, none of this is really that new. Uh, we're building on technology that's existed for decades in some cases. Um, what we really want to do is a few things. And the first is actually making it easier for service owners to actually run their applications. Uh, other than that, we want to kind of create this abstraction between what operators are doing to provision machines, as well as let service owners upgrade their own core libraries and their core system at their own pace. Um, and lastly, we want to make sure that we have one team that's doing sort of the menial work of actually keeping your hosts up and running, and you don't need to, sh to farm that out into every team across your fleet, uh, across your engineering organization. So I think these will justify the trade-offs at the end. Um, 
so the key here is that, uh, as Ben Hinman mentioned earlier in the keynote, uh, Mesos and Aurora are going to provide some excellent uh, primitives to build distributed systems. And previously, before we used this, Twitter's engineering organization uh, needed to sort of figure out their own solutions for all of these problems. So we sort of had standardized on using Scala and Finagle, but when it came to deployment strategies, to how we do updates, how we do rollbacks, everything was sort of hand-rolled and custom. Some people would write their scripts in Bash or Ruby, and it was really difficult because teams were sort of spending all of their time in their own infrastructure and not spend time building up their own applications. So this meant that each team made mistakes and progress on their own without sort of shared improvements and a shared knowledge that we could all build upon. So in this case, what we really need to do is make sure that they're um, abstracted away from these considerations and just improving their services. In addition, this means that your DevOps or SREs uh, can start contributing back to the applications themselves and not being worried about um, doing kernel upgrades or building out deployment tooling. Um, when you do put people inside of containers, uh, one thing, again, from an SRE perspective is uh, I don't need to be a TPM and say, hey, we really need to upgrade the JVM or we really need to upgrade the Python interpreter. So I need to go out to every team that's using Java or every team that's using Python and run their tests and make sure that they are upgraded and it's compatible with the new interpreter. So in this case, um, making sure that I'm actually isolated from what my users are running is extremely powerful. And it means that I can actually upgrade whatever I need and users can upgrade what they need without having to go through and hunt down every team that's priorities are different or maybe they're focusing on improving the product instead of uh, contributing back and pushing back on technical debt. And this means that your overall uh, organization is going to be much faster, which is awesome. Um, so Aurora and Mesos do best when they're running in large data center-wide clusters, uh, and this is how they drive efficiency and improve maintenance efficiency. So because of this, um, this sort of lends itself very well to make sure that there's sort of one team to rule all of provisioning, maintenance, and repair for hosts. So for us, again, as I mentioned earlier, this means nobody needs to write their own deployment scripts. Uh, you don't need to wait for weeks and weeks for capacity to show up. You can just increase someone's quota using the Aurora um, admin API. And you can also set up some simple and standard checks to uh, validate hardware is working correctly. And if it's not, you can just take it out and task will get rescheduled somewhere else. Um, so now we're going to get into a little bit of the, uh, some of the bad parts. Um, so here's where, uh, these are some of the interesting problems we've encountered, but uh, again, they haven't really caused any outages necessarily. Um, so this is the over-educated problems mean. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but uh, so uh, using Aurora, services can write uh, what's essentially Python to make it, uh, to really describe exactly what their service is going to look like uh, using a DSL that we've created. And uh, unfortunately, because it's Python, we've actually had people import Twisted and set up a web server and do all kinds of crazy things inside of their configuration. Um, and I've actually had people write like a self-executing config, uh, which ran the Aurora client from its configuration, which was sort of this weird, like the client was calling the config, which then got invoked again. Um, so in this case, it, we sort of gave people a lot of rope, and of course they did bad things with it. Um, so we're working on figuring out what config looks like. Um, we're still, uh, if you're going to see Bill Farner's talk uh, tomorrow, he's actually going to talk a lot about some of the work we've done for deployment, so I'd highly recommend that. Um, in addition, uh, we've had some issues um, upgrading the Aurora client, so making sure that the command line was consistent. Um, so I think we learned a lot about how we do upgrades and make sure that it's easy going from release to release. Um, I'm going to kind of skip over the uh, SSL certificates. I think everybody probably has experience with that. Um, but lastly, resource isolation with Mesos. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, users wonder, why are we being throttled? Why are you only giving me four gigs of memory? Um, and when we tell them, well, you asked for four gigs of memory, so we did exactly what you asked, they say, well, if I needed more, you should have just known. All right, uh, so um, this is a case where actually you do want to educate users, and I think that's where the community really investing in documentation and improving the way that we're getting the message out to uh, help applications and service owners become cloud native is really critical. Uh, so for operators, uh, so this is annoying Facebook girl. Um, so in this case, for operators, uh, we've had a terrible time trying to compile native code. I think this is a little bit more specific to our environment. Um, this is just something we need to figure out uh, within Twitter. Um, but I think it sounds like the open source community still has this problem. It's difficult to compile Aurora in some cases, so it's something we're still working on. Um, but I'd like to go into a little bit more detail about deploying Mesos and Aurora itself. Um, Aurora, like I said, provides excellent deployment automation, but uh, when you need to deploy the thing that deploys the things, you you're kind of on your own. There's nobody there to, to build that out for you. So uh, one thing that's really interesting is Aurora 1075, which is actually using it to schedule an instance on every host. Um, 
that's still in the early design phases. So unfortunately, we sort of needed to, uh, the SRE team needed to support ourselves in this case. So right now we're using Puppet, which obviously we're running it on every host in the data center, which means it scales. Uh, but this leads to mutable infrastructure. So what this means is that uh, each host is sort of running a certain version of the configuration across the data center at some time. And essentially we're running Puppet via cron, and that means that different hosts are running different versions uh, different times, and we don't really have a good way to control that. So unfortunately, um, because of the way the Puppet's working, uh, we also can't order operations. So if we need to reboot to upgrade to a new kernel or enable some new flags to take advantage of better resource isolation, we're not going to be able to use Puppet for that, and we'll need to build extensive automation tooling outside of that. Um, in fact, we recently had an issue where uh, we changed the startup script to rely upon another package. Uh, that failed to execute when the RPM wasn't installed in time, and we sort of had uh, Puppet rolling through and uh, essentially stopping our slaves on us. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but we've had some issues with this, so we're trying to figure out what can we do here that's going to be better. Um, so I'm kind of trying to think about this uh, using an analogy here. Um, so if you uh, consider the network, you know, your normal TCP IP uh, network that's in a data center, uh, that's going to be very well supported. You're typically going to have a network engineering team, a network operations team, and they're going to have uh, an excellent pulse on what the network looks like inside of your data center. So this is mission critical because every service is going to rely on this network always being up. But of course, Again, this isn't the happy talk. Uh, everybody knows that things are going to break every now and then. So uh, there's an IPMI network, uh, lights out management, sort of an out of band way to get serial access to a host if you need to go in and troubleshoot what's going on if the network is down. So only a few people are going to even know this exists, and probably fewer still will have access to it. But when the network is down, it needs to be up and running. So for us, we think that Aurora and Mesos are the network. This is what most of the teams are using and relying upon. And we need to sort of figure out what does an IPMI network look like. If we need to go onto hosts and make sure that we're sort of pinpointing or doing deployments, we need something to be able to do that for us. Um, so right now, my teammates and I uh, are testing out a system using Ansible and Zookeeper for coordination. And uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is remove as much of this mutability as possible. So in this case, we want to make uh, the base operating system very, very simple and very, very uh, slim down and take advantage of the file system isolation. So users are just bringing down their container and spinning up their services. Um, we're really hoping that. Uh, our hunch is correct, uh, so we're going to test our hypothesis, uh, and if it looks like it's being, um, if it's being proved out, then we'll definitely open source this and get some more feedback from the community. Um, but yeah, if you see me in the hallway and if you have opinions on this, I'd love to talk a little bit more about this as well. Um, so now we get to the fun part. Um, so I think when you're running a cluster management system like Aurora and Mesos, uh, you pretty much putting all of your eggs into one basket. Um, like I said, there are trade-offs and risks, but for the most part, we've been okay with this based on the benefits that we're going to get from these. Um, and in addition, uh, based on the amount of time that we've been running in this in production, uh, we found that we have enough knobs to actually get out of most issues or sort of change the way that default behaviors work depending on uh, certain external factors that are coming up. Um, this is one of my favorite memes I've made, actually. Uh, <laughs> The worst part was actually when this was right. Um, I like used this a few times, and it was like kind of a joke, and then it was real, and that wasn't good. Um, so anytime you're deploying this, uh, you know, system that's going to manage every task in your data center or in your cloud or something, um, you know, you can sort of run the risk that any change is sort of you're introducing something different into the system, and that could cause any of these outages we're going to talk about here. Uh, so this is where it's really critical that whichever team is managing this infrastructure is going to invest heavily in its own deployment automation, its own tooling, and its own testing, and then contribute back to the open source community so we all get to take advantage of this. Um, if you just want to upgrade uh, via the Apache releases, obviously they're vetted and going to be stable, so that's another way to do it. Um, but we actually deploy multiple times per week uh, with really, really small diffs. Uh, and so that's actually made it really easy. In case we do have issues, we're able to isolate you know, just a few lines of code and see what went wrong. Uh, and the rollback is pretty clean in that case as well, which is nice. So uh, we're first going to start with just the third worst case scenario. Um, for the most part, this isn't a big deal. Um, so here, if you do get paged, if a host goes down, uh, then just like Spider-Man running into the fire, you're probably doing it wrong and not saving the infrastructure. You're probably causing problems. Um, 
So in this case, there's actually a few things you need to be thoughtful of. Uh, infrastructure needs to be uh, trying to make sure that you know, the hosts are as resilient as possible. Um, you know, if you buy commodity hardware, it's going to fail. So there's only so much you can do. And in that case, you need to make sure you're working with service owners to ensure that you're, they're using proper load balancing strategies. They're not going to be affected if just one host goes down. Maybe they're a little bit over-provisioned for failure, uh, that sort of thing. Um, kind of going into that uh, puppet issue I was talking about earlier. Uh, so an example of this was uh, actually just last week, unfortunately. Um, so every organization knows you should never make a change to everything all at once at the same time. Um, and even though we know that, we were like, oh, it's fine. It's just a small, small diff. Um, so uh, even though we did that, um, Unfortunately, what happened is uh, there was sort of an ordering problem in terms of what we were installing when. And so when the Mesos slave, uh, the new RPM was installed, we have a setting in the uh, spec file to actually restart the process. Uh, when it was using the new startup script, it actually didn't come up. So it was just sort of flapping and continuing, continuing to stay down. Um, and after the task uh, was down for long enough and not sending status updates to the master, that slave was marked lost. Um, so we were helped out initially because we uh, have set a slave removal rate, so we've limited how many slaves can be removed from the master at a time. Uh, so I'd actually highly recommend setting that and making sure that you're using that. Um, in practice, we've wanted that to be set pretty low. Um, the times where something like this has happened, where we didn't want to kill everything at once, are usually much, much more frequent than the case where there's a huge power outage and we do actually lose you know, thousands of machines at the same time. Um, so we're sort of okay with being safe in the general case. And then you know, if we do detect an issue, then we can come in and manually increase that limit to get these slaves added back in quickly. Um, one thing, another thing that we did that uh, really helped us out a lot is we actually stopped the masters. So this is something that typically is pretty safe. Uh, again, we have a very large cluster, so um, as we were growing out even maybe a year and a half, two years ago, uh, we're sort of worried, oh, you know, we need to be delicate with these things, you know, it's very care you know, be careful with this, what happens if there's a thundering herd problem. Um, fortunately for us, you know, we can take the masters down, bring them back up, and same thing with Aurora. Um, you know, we don't have any problems with this. So for us, stopping the masters sort of prevented all of these slaves from being removed and got us out of the issue that we were, uh, bought us the time to get out of the issue and think that through. Um, lastly, one thing we did is, uh, because we're using Puppet to configure the slaves, is we actually, um, we were able to page the team that manages Puppet and ask them to stop Puppet masters, and that sort of prevented all of this configuration from being rolled out uh, continually. So in this case, we sort of stopped the bleeding as well. Um, so, you know, there's sort of multiple ways you can attack this. So uh, if we just stopped the masters, then we still would have had slaves that were sort of in a bad state. Um, but fortunately, things would have been okay if we were able to bring that back. So, um, but in this case, if you're able to prevent the configuration from touching them at all, you're not going to run the risk of any other bugs coming in or causing problems. Um, so, yeah, this was, uh, like I said, pretty recently. So it was kind of good timing, I guess. Um, but, yeah, so now we're going to move on to the second worst case scenario. Um, so this is sort of the thing which, uh, I don't want to say it happens all the time, um, but this is probably what um, I'm most thoughtful of. Um, this is where most of our issues probably be, they fit into this kind of thing. So this is if one of these three systems goes down, your centralized coordination is going to be down. So obviously, uh, Aurora and Mesos both rely on Zookeeper, so uh, for leader election and coordination. Um, so if this happens, that means that your users won't be able to do any deployments. They're not going to be able to run the Aurora command to push out new code. Uh, if they need to roll back, they're not going to be able to roll back. So this is particularly bad in that case. Uh, if a few slaves go lost, then no task will be rescheduled. So you won't be able to get these services back up to full strength. Um, if you're using cron uh, in Aurora, then Aurora obviously won't be up to launch cron jobs. Uh, and in addition, Aurora won't be able to use task reconciliations. So you might have some of these what we call ghost instances, which are multiple copies of the same instance running on a few hosts. So that won't be running as well. Uh, typically, that isn't a big problem, but um, it can still cause some frustration for users as well. So uh, there are a few ways that you can get into this state, which is sort of unfortunate. Um, so uh, one example was actually uh, we had a deploy where um, we deployed a SHA, which we should not have done. Um, so again, remember to make sure that team is investing in their build and deployment automation. Um, so we actually had something where uh, we rolled forward. And then when we rolled back, we actually uh, had written some entries into the log that Aurora was using, uh, where there was no version of the scheduler could actually read the contents of that log. So essentially, the scheduler would come up, try to recover the state of the cluster, and say, oh, whoa, that looks weird, and then kill itself. And it just kept doing that. Uh, so that wasn't, I wasn't very proud of that, actually. Um, 
But uh, fortunately, we were able to isolate what the problem was and actually make a change to Aurora to accept that entry and then do another deploy, which took care of that. So um, this is sort of, uh, I think this is one of the great benefits of having an engineering organization which is deploying its infrastructure so quickly is that, again, the diff was so small that we were able to see what the issue was and be able to react to it really, really quickly. Um, Another case could be uh, if you need to change the amount of uh, machines which represent the quorum. So uh, we actually went from three hosts uh, as the scheduler to five. And when we did that, we uh, built a ton of automation to do this. And um, this is a case where if you do maybe make some mistakes or if you're trying to rely on checklists or it's not very well automated, uh, you could run up in a case where you do have um, sort of a split brain operation. So I would definitely say if this is something you're doing, um, sort of consider maybe sending an email to the user list or the dev list. So um, if you guys have any questions about this, you know, obviously I think we can make this a little bit better. Uh, lastly is uh, sometimes, uh, this is probably more prevalent uh, a few years ago, I think, um, but occasionally we'd have some timeouts when trying to write entries into the replicated log. And in this case, this was primarily some I.O. contention. So we actually tracked this down to a log rotate process, which was just uh, rotating the actual scheduler log itself on the same disk which we were writing the replicated log. So I think those are two things that we learned there. Um, Similar to Zookeeper, they say, you know, log to a different disk from what you're actually using to store Zookeeper's data. Um, so in this case, you know, we needed to track down what this was and then change the way that we were doing log rotate. Um, so that actually helped a lot, which was uh, pretty helpful. So moving to Mesos. Um, for the most part, uh, because Mesos is now using state, using the replicated log itself, uh, it sort of has that same thing. But uh, we've actually only found that um, Zookeeper is, uh, the way the Mesos uses Zookeeper can sometimes lead to some issues, um, but I don't think, uh, based on my memory, I can't really remember any other cases where this has been down just by itself. Um, so we're gonna kinda talk about Zookeeper a little bit here. Um, so the first step is make sure that whatever your environment is and whatever you're able to, um, whatever uh, tolerances you're able to have within that infrastructure, make sure that you're tuning your uh, session timeout correctly. Uh, so in this case, if you have a master which is elected, make sure that if it's gone for a few seconds, maybe that's fine, uh, but you don't want it to be gone for you know three minutes or something like that, because uh, in that case, maybe you do have split brain, some master gets separated, some other master gets elected, uh, and then maybe they're making different decisions, which isn't nice. Uh, we learned the hard way um, that uh, when we're building out resource isolation within our shared clusters on Mesos, uh, we were sort of using a shared service which didn't have similar focus on resource isolation. So in this case, uh, we were co-locating, uh, like our users were using a service discovery zookeeper, and we're using that same ensemble for leader election. So unfortunately what happened is we got into a case where a few bad clients were um, slamming that Zookeeper ensemble, and they were hitting it so hard that they caused some imbalance in other clients, and those started trying to re-register and uh, re-register their server sets. Uh, unfortunately, that put so much load on the Zookeeper ensemble that Aurora lost its leader election. Um, and so we sort of had these services which kept trying to reconnect, kept trying to reconnect and continue adding watches, and Aurora could never get elected because it just couldn't hold on to a, to a lock in there. Um, so unfortunately, we sort of ran into this catch-22 where um, there were a ton of services we needed to restart, and Aurora wasn't up to actually restart them. So uh, this was not one of my favorite incidents, actually. Um, so in this case, uh, like I said, this is really important to, if you can't do software isolation, physical isolation of different ensembles is important. Um, this was where I made this meme. Uh, if any of you watch South Park, um, yeah, we had a pretty bad time with this, unfortunately. So after this incident, um, essentially what we did is we were able to SSH the machines, kill off the processes. We were going through the Zookeeper logs to figure out which IPs were misbehaving. Uh, we identified the, the PIDs, killed those, got us enough space. Uh, oh, and then we also, um, we actually blocked stuff off at the switch level, so we actually sort of isolated off part of the cluster from the Zookeeper ensemble, and we slowly added back subnets. So in that case, we just had a sort of a multi-tiered approach to get us back there. Um, so after this, uh, we said, you know what, enough's enough. Aurora needs to be on its own ensemble. We're gonna take the time. Uh, we wrote tons and tons of code. We made sure this was really well tested uh, because we knew that essentially what we were doing is, um, this is Paul Steiner who's swapping gliders in midair. Um, which I think is crazy. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's kind of like your SRE team if they try and do this. Um, so again, we knew that this was terrible. Um, but uh, when it came time for Mesos, uh, pretty much we'd moved Aurora off 
And then, unfortunately, Mesos had the same thing happen to it. Uh, it was using another high SLA ZooKeeper ensemble, uh, which was also shared. Uh, so unfortunately for that one, some other clients on that uh, were giving it problems. And uh, Mesos, again, lost its lock and couldn't get an, a leader elected. Uh, so in this case, we essentially just shut down the masters to make sure they didn't come up. And we decided we were just going to pivot live, just make a change to all of the slaves all at once uh, to point them to a different zookeeper ensemble. Um, my team and I were pretty sure we knew what we were doing. Um, and uh, fortunately, you know, everything worked out all right for us. Uh, as soon as we brought them back up, uh, we connected the masters, pivoted them to the new ensemble, brought them back up, and we'd essentially migrated tens of thousands of, of servers to a new ZooKeeper ensemble without anybody noticing. So uh, we didn't get a party, but we probably should have. So this is pretty rad. Oh, uh, man. OK. Um, yeah, it's getting pretty bad, actually. So this only happened once. Um, I was still uh, a young engineer at the time. So uh, this is actually where, this is probably the thing that I like dread the most. Uh, this is where we actually rescheduled everything in the cluster all at the same time. Uh, this is not good. So um, we were debugging some slowness in one of the masters. Uh, and so to do that, we were dumping all of the tasks in the kernel. So we sent a sysrqt. Uh, and we still. Uh, I forget what the root cause was offhand. I should have written this down. I'm sorry. Uh, so that host actually was paused for 17 minutes. Um, and so the rest of the cluster, all the other masters said, all right, well, I don't know where that guy went, so whatever. So uh, another master was elected. The cluster continued to run as normal. That was fine. Um, Fortunately, what happened is at 17 minutes and seven seconds or something, uh, that master came back. And uh, the way that the threads were working, it uh, checked all of the slave time, the last time all of the slaves had last registered, and it compared it to the current timestamp. It said, wow, those slaves have been gone for 17 minutes. They're not there anymore. So yeah, so, uh, so it actually sent, uh, it just basically bombarded Aurora and said, it's all gone. Man, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you've been doing, but have you noticed there's nothing here anymore? Uh, and so this is a message, like, if you get this in your framework, you're just like, oh, OK. All right, we've got some scheduling to do. Uh, so Aurora marked all of the tasks on all of the slaves as lost and just said, well, they're not there anymore. That's fine. Uh, so it said, well, let's get them back up and running. Let's reschedule them. Um, and as it started scheduling all of these tasks, Mesos was getting these status up, uh, was sending out, uh, so sending these resource offers, scheduling these tasks, and these status updates came back. It was starting to spam the scheduler driver, which Aurora used. And uh, unfortunately, we just had this queue which kept growing unbounded, essentially. We weren't able to respond to these status updates fast enough. Um, we were also launching GC executors, which is an out-of-band solution that Aurora was using to reconcile state of what should be running and what is. And unfortunately, this was uh, very unhelpful for us. Uh, because even though Aurora was, this is what actually killed everything. So even though Aurora was sort of like, I can't handle this right now. Uh, and again, this was a long time ago. Uh, now it would happily churn through this. Um, but yeah, as soon as it launched all these GC executors, it was just like, you shouldn't be there, you shouldn't be there, you shouldn't be there, you shouldn't be there. Killed everything. Um, so yeah, that was not, was not good. So to get out of this, um, this is actually really difficult to get into now. Um, we had something that could have been pretty similar. Uh, just happened, I think, a few months ago. And actually, Aurora was able to schedule thousands and thousands of tasks within just a few, few seconds. Um, so, but in this case, to get out of this, we actually increased the task timeout. Because what would happen is we schedule a task, and we say, all right, please, just, just go, and, and please just run. Live your life. Just do it. And uh, because we had all of these status updates in the queue, we wouldn't hear back from it in time. And so we'd say, ah, you know, we launched one, and it's just gone. All right, we'll send another one. And so we'd keep sending more and more of these tasks, and all of these tasks would try and send us these status updates. So we increased the task timeout so we didn't uh, sort of overreact, and we just sort of said, well, hopefully it got scheduled. Well, that's fine. And then we could keep trying to process the queue. Uh, in addition, we decreased the scheduling rate that Aurora uses. So in this case, we didn't send out as many tasks. We didn't respond to as many resource offers, and that helped significantly. Uh, and then lastly, actually, we just turned off the GC executor. We were like, you've done enough. That's fine. Um, 
Now, obviously, we're using task reconciliation, so we don't have this out-of-band process, uh, which is nice because we actually had a few slaves which uh, they were actually bin packed so tightly that we couldn't launch a GC executor on them to uh, reconcile that uh, after the fact. So in that case, we sort of um, we cleared out a few machines just as part of our normal maintenance cycle, and we actually got a ton more resources back. So um, yeah, that wasn't good either. Uh, if you really are back against the wall, you can do something sort of similar to what we did with that zookeeper issue, uh, where you can just turn off you know, thousands of slaves, bring up a few at a time, slowly let them get back in and um, sort of back off as you need. But uh, we didn't need to do this in this case, thankfully. So now that I've said that terrible thing, it's much better now. So I guess this is the marketing-y part. Um, so we're much, much better at scheduling with Aurora, which is awesome. Uh, we've added tons of safeguards as part of this. Uh, this was probably one of the best postmortems I've ever written, which is pretty fun. Um, so again, we're rate limiting slave removals. This is one reason why I say it's probably fine to not kill the whole cluster at once. Uh, and then we also added that key bit right there where it's uh, gonna make sure, hey, are you actually the master or are you just confused? So that's a helpful check as well. Uh, and then lastly, task reconciliation, which is nice. So I didn't want to actually put that last bit because I feel like that's tempting fate, um, but we're not superstitious in the Mesos and Aurora community. Um, so this would be if you actually lost the entire cluster. Uh, so this is where you're, you pretty much view the scheduler page and it says, cool, what do you want me to do? And you're like, uh, where did everything go? Um, so we have a lot of um, pieces in place. Obviously, this has been running for years and years in production. Um, so knock on wood, this never happens. Uh, Aurora does have backups, so this is what we rely on. Um, we do have red, red versus blue exercises within our team to exercise this and make sure that the backups do work. Um, but if it doesn't work, you need to send that email to you know all of engineering and say, hey, you know all your jobs. Do you mind just Aurora? create, could you just create those jobs again, um, which isn't the best user experience. So we definitely try to avoid this. This is the worst case scenario, I think. Um, so yeah, that's pretty fun. Um, so all this being said, um, I mean, I, to be honest, I think that uh, the approach and uh, the implementation of these systems, I think, is the right way to go. I think there's still plenty, as you heard in the keynotes, there's still plenty of work to be done. There's lots of features we need. Um, but I, I really believe in this community, and I think that all of these teams have the right mindset. And I think that they're looking at it from how do we actually make sure that this infrastructure is maintainable and around for the long haul. Um, they've always worked really well with all of the SREs and DevOps that I've worked with in my communities. And um, because of that, we're actually able to make sure that entire enterprises are relying on these systems uh, to run everything. Um, which is pretty awesome. So, uh, yeah, so with that said, um, I hang out in the Aurora and Mesos rooms in Freenode uh, at Yasumoto, and obviously Twitter SRE is hiring if you'd like to solve some of these problems and uh, make sure that last one doesn't happen, which would be great. Um, but yeah, we've got uh, eight minutes for questions. So thanks, everyone. <laughs> questions, anybody? Uh, so the question was, uh, we talked about slimming down our operating system. Uh, have we considered other alternatives, such as CoreOS? Uh, honestly, we're, we're pretty much open to anything at this point. Um, right now, I think that uh, what I would like to do is not support like a whole custom o operating system. We do have an OS team at Twitter. Um, so we're kind of trying to figure out what does this new like slim OS or something look like. Uh, it might just be as simple as you know this is CentOS 7 or you know this is the generic uh, core OS distribution. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, I'd love to hear opinions if you have any thoughts on it as well. Yep. Have you ever experienced a network partition? Have we ever experienced a network partition? Oh yeah, lots of network partitions. For what parts? A anything, I guess. Sure. Uh, so the question is, uh, what happens during network partitions for you know the Zookeeper ensemble, or maybe if the Aurora scheduler can't talk to the Zookeeper, or the core can't talk to the Zookeeper? Um, that's happened a few times. Uh, I think that's kind of represented by um, 
those outages where Zookeeper is getting slammed. Uh, if anything, that's a little bit more dangerous because you're actually able to get some messages through and it's not a clean break. Um, I feel like in those instances where it's just like, oh, hey, you know, this core switch went down, you know, NetEng will get it back in a few hours, like that's fine. You know, we're just hanging out, the cluster's running, it's no big deal. Um, the weird ones have always been where it's like, we can kind of get some messages through, so we kind of come up, cause some trouble, and then go down. Um, but fortunately, because of, again, like the slave rate limit, uh, slave removal rate limit, um, that's been a little bit better, which is nice. But yeah, we've had tons of those issues, for sure, with all three of these systems. So. It sounds like Zookeeper is kind of a nightmare for you. Do you see that being a part of the equation long term, or is that just a step up? The question was, is, uh, it seems like Zookeeper is a bit of a nightmare for us, um, and do we think about migrating off of it? Uh, honestly, it's, uh, I think that it's actually sort of nice to sort of concentrate all of that complexity into one system. Um, for the most part, it's dealing with really, really difficult problems and it handles it really, really well. So we are throwing tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of clients at it. Um, and it's been able to withstand tons of load. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't want to say no, but I'm just not sure that there's anything else that can really stand up to. Uh, it's definitely the most production ready service that I've experienced, I would say. Other questions? Yep. So how many Zookeeper members do you have in the ensemble? Uh, the question is, how many Zookeeper members do we have uh, per ensemble? Uh, we don't have a large quorum, uh, but the way that we get around that uh, to scale out reads is we add tons of um, observers. So we had tons of observers, and those actually scale out really, really well. So um, they've been able to handle most of the read traffic, and that's where most of uh, the incoming requests come in. Um, so for the most part, you can throw more observers in, and it'll be able to scale out pretty well. So um, we don't have, uh, we run five, I don't know, we run five Zookeeper um, members that are in there, and then tons of observers to scale out. Upgrades for the slave? Yeah. yeah, so the question is, are we using Puppet to handle upgrades of the slave? Um, we are, actually. So we're just installing uh, an RPM for the Mesa slave, uh, as well as for the components that are using um, uh, that's like per host components for Aurora. Um, if you look at that YouTube video, that kind of goes into a little bit more of the detail of how we do that. Um, but yeah, for the most part, like I said, it, it works really well. Um, it's just that I think we're kind of getting to the point where we need to uh, pare down what's actually executing on each host for the most part. So. Yeah, I think ideally what I think we're moving towards is where our, us upgrading a slave is just, just shut it down, re-image it, and it comes back up. So instead of just rebooting a host, we'll just re-image it and it comes up. So um, yeah, we're just trying to keep it really simple like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So uh, the question is, how do we deal with maintenance across the hosts? Um, so we actually put a ton of work into Aurora's maintenance API. So it's actually a really, really powerful feature um, because it also includes SLAs for production jobs. And so we're actually able to, to give an SLA to our users, and we're able to do maintenance uh, based on the SLAs that we've set. So when we're going through, we can say, oh, we can take down these, you know, 2,000 hosts or something right now, and it's not going to affect anyone's SLA, and that's great. So uh, we're actually going to cleanly drain all of these tasks, and we'll send a task killed message, and we'll say the reason was for maintenance. Uh, so that way, in case the users say, hey, why did we lose you know, 300 instances all of a sudden? They'll say, oh, it's because you know, Joe's doing maintenance or something. Um, so in that case, we're not causing any lost tasks. Um, tasks sort of have their shutdown, little bit of grace period to close any connections, that sort of thing. Um, and then we're able to take it down, do what we need to do. So And obviously, Aurora will reschedule them somewhere else their service. Yep. Uh, the question is about uh, containerization formats. Um, so we don't use, uh, so we're actually using Mesos built-in isolation. So um, we're using uh, the CPU isolation, uh, memory, uh, and network isolation as well. So we're not using like Docker or anything in production. Uh, but we're looking forward to like the open container format. We think that that's a really awesome thing. So, what else? Yep. Uh, 
what it's worth. Uh, other questions? All righty. No one else? Yep. Uh, do we have plans for an HTTP-based API for Aurora? Is that the question? Uh, there is, I think there is an HTTP API. Like, I think under the hood, it's Thrift, which is HTTP. Um, but I would actually, uh, but I think there are some rumblings of that, and I think that's what's going to get us, I think similar to Mesos, that's what's going to get us to a 1.0. So um, I think there just sort of needs to be some, like, interest on the dev list to, to push that forward. But yeah, I think that'd be awesome, for sure. So, all right, last chance. All right, sweet. Thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it.